Two years earlier, this thing was on magazine cover. Bright yellow, streamlined, the future of American rail travel right there in glossy print. By October 1948, it was parked in a Virginia rail yard. Unwanted, $6 million worth of passenger cars were already being sold off to whoever would take them. Some of those cars got shipped all the way to Argentina, and the three locomotives that were supposed to pull the most luxurious train America had ever seen. Nobody knew what to do with them. They just sat there. Within two years, all three would be cut up for scrap. Not a single museum showed any interest in saving one. And the man who dreamed up this whole project, who staked his reputation on it, who told the press this was the future? This is the Chesapeake and Ohio M1. Longer than a big boy, heavier than a big boy, more expensive than almost anything that had ever run on American rail. It was presented to the public as living proof that steam technology still had a future in the age of diesel. Tens of thousands of people saw it at the Chicago Railroad Fair. The press ate it up. Railroad magazines ran features, and the thing could not reliably finish a single scheduled route without something breaking. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railway was one of America's biggest coal haulers in the 1940s. It built its fortune dragging coal out of the Appalachians to the ports and steel mills of the East. Robert Young had been running it since 1942, and he had ambitions that went beyond freight. He had a slogan that made him famous in the industry. A hog can cross the country without changing trains, but you can't. He thought that was a disgrace. He wanted to fix American passenger rail. His plan was a train called the Chessie, named after the sleeping kitten that had been the company mascot since 1933. The route would run from Washington to Cincinnati in 12 hours, and the experience would be unlike anything else in the country. There would be dome cars with panoramic views of the passing landscape. There would be a dining car that converted into a movie theater at night showing the latest Hollywood releases. There would be a dedicated children's play area with toys and supervision, and in the lounge, an aquarium stocked with tropical fish. That last detail is going to matter later. The passenger cars were ordered from the Bud Company, 46 of them. The total cost was over $6 million, and that was 1940s money. But Young did not want just any locomotive pulling this train. The Chesapeake in Ohio made its fortune hauling coal, having his prestigious new flagship pulled by diesel locomotives burning oil would send entirely the wrong message to the coal industry that paid his bills. So he commissioned Baldwin Locomotive Works and Westinghouse to build something that had never been attempted at this scale, a coal-fired steam turbine with electric transmission. The idea sounded elegant, a turbine generating steam from a coal-fired boiler, that steam driving a generator, that generator powering electric traction motors on the axles, all the smooth power delivery of electric drive, all while burning the fuel the Chesapeake and Ohio was in business to sell. What Baldwin and Westinghouse delivered was a monster. It was 150 feet long, including the tender, and it was heavier than a big boy, which is the largest steam locomotive ever built. Its design output was 6,000 horsepower. Its theoretical top speed was 100 miles per hour. The coal bunker sat at the front of the locomotive. The boiler was mounted backwards, facing the rear. The cab sat in the middle between them, which meant the engineer had his turbine and electrical controls in front of him, while his boiler and firing controls were behind him. The entire machine was wrapped in a streamlined shell painted bright yellow, gray, and navy blue. Number 500 was delivered in 1947. Numbers 501 and 502 followed in early 1948. And here is where they started selling fantasy. The publicity campaign was enormous. Magazine covers and press tours showcased the locomotive widely. At the Chicago Railroad Fair in 1948 and 1949, tens of thousands of visitors walked past this gleaming yellow machine and were told they were looking at the future of American railroading. The Chesapeake and Ohio promoted it relentlessly. What they did not publicize was that behind the scenes, the M1 was failing constantly. That coal bunker mounted at the front created an immediate problem. When the locomotive moved, 
fine coal dust blew straight backwards into the cab. The engineer and fireman sat in a haze of black grit. But that was just discomfort. The real damage happened when that same dust got into the traction motors, causing short circuits again and again. Meanwhile, the backwards-mounted boiler had its own issues. Water leaked from it and found its way into the electrical systems, causing more short circuits. The firebox required constant steady airflow to function properly, completely unlike the rhythmic puffing of a conventional reciprocating steam engine. Experienced firemen who had worked their entire careers on normal locomotives could not keep the fire burning properly. Later accounts describe what lay under that beautiful streamlined shell as an absolute nightmare of steam plumbing, electrical wiring, and mechanical components that nobody could access for maintenance without disassembling half the machine first. According to Wikipedia and American Rails, the M1 locomotives could not reliably complete the planned Washington to Cincinnati route without suffering mechanical problems somewhere along the way. This was not an occasional issue. It was consistent. And while the Chesapeake and Ohio was still desperately trying to make the M1 work, competitor Baltimore and Ohio went ahead and launched the Cincinnati on the exact same route in February 1948. Conventional diesel locomotives. Nothing experimental. That train immediately proved two uncomfortable facts. First, the market for premium day service between Washington and Cincinnati was far smaller than anyone had projected. Second, even a conventional, much cheaper train lost money on that route. The Chesapeake and Ohio had poured millions into an experimental locomotive designed to serve a market that turned out not to exist in any meaningful size. About those tropical fish in the lounge aquarium, there is an oft-repeated story that during test runs, the fish did not survive the vibrations of the ride. Whether that specific detail is documented or apocryphal, it captures something true about this project. October 1948. The entire Chessie project was canceled. No paying passenger ever set foot on that train. The Bud cars were transferred around and then sold off piecemeal to anyone who wanted them. The Dome cars ended up at the B&O in the Denver and Rio Grande. A batch of coaches was shipped to South America. The M1 locomotives were demoted to pulling secondary passenger service between Clifton Forge and Charlottesville, a tiny fraction of the prestigious long-haul route they had been designed and built for. They did not even physically fit on the turntable at Cincinnati Union Terminal. That is how absurdly long they were. By 1949, all three M1 locomotives were sitting on dead storage track. In 1950, they were scrapped three years after delivery. After the publicity tour, there was no second act, just silence. Robert Young left the Chesapeake in Ohio in 1954 and took over the New York Central. He could not turn that railroad around either. In January 1958, he suspended the dividend. On the 25th of that same month, he shot himself. He had struggled with severe depression for more than 15 years, partly rooted in the loss of his daughter in a plane crash in 1940. The M1s exist now only in old photographs and as scale models for collectors. No museum ever preserved one. And the train that the Chesapeake and Ohio paraded in front of tens of thousands of people as irrefutable proof of the future of railroading never carried a single paying passenger. They hyped it. It failed. They buried it. And they never spoke of it again.